And there is no early stage money in Thailand for Thai specific founders who speak Thai but would have a big market in Thailand. And that's the bottleneck essentially. That's actually really interesting. Right. Like, how can you get funded? So I said, oh no, we have to go to, we have to come to Singapore, we have to register here, we have to look for some, you know, support for that. Hey everyone, I'm here with Ted Nauso going uh, by Ted to simplify things. Uh, Ted, I'm super excited to have you on the show. We've already met before. Uh, we had a really good conversation, so I wanted to keep that going on the podcast. Uh, so, Ted, do you want to give a quick intro about yourself? Yeah, sure. Hey, I'm Ted. Um, I'm basically uh, originally from Yangon, but I live here in the Bangkok for 16 years now. So I'm a tech co-founder. So I studied the uh, the hotel supply chain management software less ten years ago uh, as a technical co-founder. And the uh, currently, you know, uh, the team is based in Tha uh, Thailand, uh, Bangkok, and most of my customers are based in Thailand. So I'm in Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, Maldives, Dubai, Qatar, and the somewhere you know I have few places, few hotels in Madagascar and Mauritius as well. So that's, that has been my uh, main product for over a decade. And the, at this moment, I'm a more, <laughs> you know, know in the, uh, our tech ecosystem, uh, startup ecosystem here in Bangkok as a creator of the uh, community. I started the startup community called uh, YC Startup School Bangkok Community. That was in July 2022 uh, when YC has that uh, summer online program. So during that time, YC recommended people uh, from us around the world war to organize the meetup. So at that time, I was happy to start, you know, uh, inviting people instead of the meetup group. We started with like 10 people, but eventually after one and a half years, we now have over 600 plus member. And awesome. then currently, but the, so we had a, some discussion with YC recently, and then it's best for us to continue hosting the meetup with a different name. So we recently renamed it as uh, our startup community. Oh, cool, yeah. So that's actually how we got connected, right? We were, uh, I was posting on LinkedIn about starting a community in Southeast Asia, and you had right. obviously built something quite significant already. So it got us chatting and we met, uh, bonded. So it was, a, it was a good meeting. And Correct me if I'm wrong, but you're also uh, heavily involved in the RubyConf and you're a self-taught Ruby on Rails developer, correct? Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, so so one of the things that I, the other things is like uh, my family is a Ruby community. So we have here like a Ruby Tuesday meetup, which is like we, we do the meetup every last Tuesday of the month. So it has been 50 meetups so far now. So we have at the small Ruby community. And then this community has started the Ruby conference here in Thailand. And that one was in the, the first one was in before COVID, right before COVID. And then the, you know, of course COVID, so no more conferences. And then it mm -hmm. has restarted in 2022 and 2023. So both year I was part of the uh, organizing team and heavily, you know, involved with that uh, community as well. So you're kind of like a community guy. You, you, you are still heavily like a technical co-founder, but it seems like a lot of your passion projects are revolving around communities, right? So what specifically draws you to running communities and why are you so good at it? I, I want to get some tips. Yeah, so that that that, that was the uh, this is like you know uh, as you can see every time I talk about uh community or you know all this uh, tech community or startup community I'm very passionate and very you know energetic you know full with full energy I could explain you know keep talking like hours and hours but when somebody uh, some I have to talk about uh the business I've been doing you know the my main business then I will be I will like you know. So, you know, you could totally <laughs> see the, you know, two side of me. And the community part was like, I think uh, one of the thing I think what happened was with my business, so it's like, you know, we started 
uh, in 2013, they developed a the new software. I gave it also to my friend. So uh, he built a team to start his own agency company in Yangon back then. So I also this to him. So he built it within a year and then I take over the product and then continue building or maintaining it myself. All right. So, so I have to land uh, Ruby on Rails, but I studied software engineering before I started working in the hot day industry. That was long times yeah. ago. It's around, like, say, 2000, right? So that time, mm-hmm. like, after I studied software engineering, there's not a lot of, uh, you know, you can easily uh, get a job in the tech industry. That was 2000. That was in Django. So yeah, there's yeah. no way we can get that. So for, uh, fortunately, I have, a, you know, uh, opportunity to work in the hotels, which is the Indonesian international kind of, you know, chain hotel. So you have some opportunities to go outside of the country or, you know, uh, it might even possible for me at some point to apply it and move it to the IT department. So that's why I started there as a storekeeper, but in the cost control and, you know, all this uh, accounting department, I spent there like five years. But at some point, I said, like, no, I don't want to spend my life in hotel. I want to be a, you know, programmer, right? So I want to get back yeah. into the IT industry. So I got one job in uh, a bank called, which is, like, not really a programmer, which is uh, it's just, like, a technical uh, operation, but of, like, you know, uh, software use in the hotel, like, you go and implement them, train them, and mm-hmm. onboard them and support them. So I worked there as an operation manager for like three years. But after that, I realized like, you know, my life is not there for other people. I mean, you know, I, I just want to be a programmer, right? I really want to be a programmer. How can I get started? I cannot just quit the job and go apply uh, any other software, you know, software house. Uh, hey, I'm, a, mm-hmm. you know, I have a job experience as, a, you know, a year, <laughs> but I don't know how to go. Can I, you know, join Wait, you as a yeah, junior yeah. programmer? It's not going to happen. So I said like the only way for me to chase my dream is like start my own business. Right. Sure. So, so I quit the job and then started, uh, you know, reselling other people's software. And at some point, mm-hmm. you know, we decided there's an opportunity camps. So I decided like, okay, uh, I will be my own product. Uh, I, I, I still don't know how to go. So I have to, uh, I meet with my friend and he said, right, he's going to open the new agency company and say like, okay, Buffett, you know, I, I need to, you to pay this software for me. I will give you money. You pay the team and then I take over. So during that project time, I have to study Ruby on Rails and everything, and then I take over. So that's how I get into the uh, the programming world. And so at some point, I've been doing all these things, didn't go to meet with other people, just, you know, always being programmer behind the laptop, right? You know, doing all the things. I really forgot about growth and anything. I don't really, you know, focus on all that stuff. But at some point, 2018, I guess, uh, like I was like, oh, it's been a five years that this company is not growing. We've been like, you know, like a lifestyle businesses, right? But I said, right. like, I, I mean, it's okay. Now I fulfill my dream of being a programmer. I know how to code. And, you know, I've been uh, writing the code that, that ran the software behind some of the big hotels here in Bangkok. So I'm like, okay, good mm-hmm. now. So what next for me? And then I was like, I don't know where to get help, right? I don't know where to go. So the first thing I saw was like, there is a Ruby conference happening mm-hmm. in Thailand. So I said like, oh, reach out to them and see. So they said, uh, they also have the Ruby community meetup every Tuesday. I said, I didn't know they, they started for like, you know, a few years back. I say like, okay, let me go meet with these people. So, you know, I go and join the community the first day because, you know, I never go to any meetup and anything. So I have no idea what to expect. The first day I arrived to the meetup, I feel like, you know, oh, there may be a lot of people like, you know, huh, expert programmer, genius, like they, might, they, might, they, don't might, they don't even want to talk to me, right? And then when I arrived, like community was very welcoming, right? Of course, mm, it's really, awesome. you know, hit it off. I was like, it's very warm welcome. So before I go, I has a lot of anxiety. Like, am I going to make friends with them? Uh, what do they think of me? Right? 
and then it's totally different. So the communities were so welcoming. Uh, the people talked to me and then really tried to know me. And then I feel like, wow, that's like what community is about, right? So I get involved with that community every meetup. I go with them, talk to them, and then only I open up a lot of you know connections and network and knowing other people. And uh, then because that time I was solo programmer, right? So I need some help mm-hmm. building something. And then I see I met people in the community and then I, I get a lot of help. So I said like wow that's what the community is right. So that's mm-hmm. why when I started this uh uh so because of those experience when there is a, a YCS to organize a meetup around the wall and then I see there is nothing in Bangkok. So I say, okay, I, I could able to start because I had an experience walking, you know, going to the meetup, uh, Ruby meetup community all the time, getting involved deeply with the uh, organizer. So I know, okay, I can do that. That's why I started. So when I really started that community and I see like, how can I really make this community a very, you know, a vibrant and helpful and, you know, welcoming? Because... I left the first experience I got when I go to the Ruby community, right? Because in the Ruby, uh, I think the Ruby society, Ruby developer, you know, uh, the society, like, you know, the community is like, we have this saying called Minasa one, which means Mass, Mass is the creator of the Ruby language, right? So he said, Mass mm. is nice, so we are. Right, so there is a mm. kind of like motto in the Ruby community, like because the okay. creator is nice, so we are always nice, right? So I said, like, okay, let me bring that kind of you know a welcoming environment to our community. So every time people, so I started organizing me meet up. So every time people come, I make sure that I give them, uh, you know, very welcoming, and then it's like make sure that they, uh, you know, whatever they need. So it's like. I think it's all come naturally at that point, you know, making people comfortable. So I think yeah. that's what make make uh, I think me becoming a successful community beta and then you know could able to beat that community uh, with you know few people to now to say hundred plus people. Yeah, it's, it's pretty obvious that you're super passionate about communities. There's no doubt about that, <laughs> the way you talk about right. it. And uh, I think you, you hit the nail like about the, the value of communities that bring people together in one way, but also build so many opportunities. I think for me, moving around a lot, I realized that when I go somewhere new, the most important thing I can do for my personal and, and business life is to join a community uh like for example i joined your community a few weeks ago i see it's super active i'm starting to see a different players and what they do etc like uh yeah I, I completely agree i think it's a it's an awesome awesome thing to do and i hope you keep building because i i love to see that growth uh, i'm curious what brought you to uh bangkok by the way because the reason i ask is I'm trying to make this podcast helpful to founders from around Southeast Asia. And I'm trying to cover the different big cities in Southeast Asia to know why people are there. A lot of people are born and raised in Thailand or in Myanmar, whatever, and and building there. But people who've moved from somewhere else to a new country, I'm curious why that is, what what they love about this place and what draws them to a certain place. So why did you move to Bangkok? Right. Uh, but that was 16 years ago. So, you know, it might be a different of the reason uh, why you want to move no, now and why you want, you want to move back then. Uh, but the one, but the one thing that always, you know, uh, attracted to all the people, uh, to Bangkok or Thailand in general is like, you know, cost of living and then very, you know, culture like Thai is a very, uh, you know, the, the culture, the people mindset, right? So it's like, you know, uh, you, when you have that uh, kind of like environment that, you know, you can go everywhere cheap, right? Let's say, for example, if you're in Singapore, that everything is expensive, right? Even, the, you know, yeah. uh, the food or everything. Uh, but in Thailand, one of the things is like, it, it doesn't matter how you rich or poor, you can get everything you want, right? So if you, if you want to spend yeah. only 50 baht, you just go to the, you know, uh, the food code or, you know, uh, street vendor and just finish your meal with that. 
But if you really want to spend like, you know, you're super rich, you want to spend big money and then go for like, you know, good mm-hmm. dinner as a buy, you, you can stay go there, right? So that that is one of the things about uh, Thailand uh, in Bangkok, right? So, so the reason when I moved in here was like, because for me, what, not because of Bangkok, I, I came. The reason for me was because I had the opportunity to leave the hotel life and get into the ID industry. That was the reason that mm-hmm. I moved, moved, moved to Bangkok. But the reason that I'm not leaving is all the things that I mentioned, right? So <laughs> living cost is nice, especially for me as a bum, it's like, you know, it's a next door, right? Uh, I mean, the neighbor yep. country, I can just fly to my family in like the one hour. Right, one hour flight yeah. time, and then the culture, the food, uh, you know, everything is same, but here is much way much better. So, what happened is like in 2010, I think, uh, the 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 Myanmar uh, started changing into democratic country, right? So, uh, mm-hmm. from the military dictatorship to the uh, democratic country, and then a lot of people go back to uh, Myanmar, started settling back then, and you know, started you know, go and grab all the uh, new opportunities and everything. Right, so a lot of people come back, especially those people living in Singapore, because the cost of living in Singapore is too high. So a lot of people, all these uh, middle class, like you know, uh, white collar people, uh, or white collar Burmese people in uh, Singapore, more I think almost all of them, they even give up their permanent residencies and everything, and go back to Yangon and start settling there, right? Start their own business and everything. And then, even though at that time there was a good opportunity, but for me, I left Bangkok more than my hometown. So I didn't really go back. I didn't start any business or anything. I just like, okay, there's a business there, there. So people enjoying it, people going back. Okay, good for me. But I don't want to leave Bangkok. So I just continue staying here. But now it's all pay off, you know. Now a lot of the people have to leave the country again. And then, you know. Mm-hmm. So- one of the problem with like uh, some of my friends, they, they give up all the PR, uh, Singapore PR, you know, permanent residency. Uh, they give up all these things. Now, now after all the coup and everything happened, now they want to go back to Singapore, but they couldn't because mm. Singapore government said, hey, you know, you already give up your PR. And then now your country has a problem. Now you want to come back to me? No, I'm not going. I'm not giving back to you. Mm, right? mm, mm. So th- there's a lot of, for me, it was like, uh, I think maybe most of the people who live in Bangkok that time, I'm sure that even though, you know, Myanmar was very attractive, a lot of people go back. I think most of us stay here because the lifestyle here is, you know, totally different. So here yeah. you can get access to international uh, community, right? there's some more opportunities here i completely agree i mean every expat in bangkok that i speak to has similar opinions basically the uh, you know wide variety of access you said you want to eat for a dollar in the streets you can but then you want to go to a michelin star dinner no problem yeah same for living i mean i think overall cost of living is super affordable Great, uh, great healthcare system, great education system, so many activities, people are super nice. It's a beautiful culture. So I completely understand people who come and stay here. Um, 16 years later, you can confirm. One thing that always puzzles me about Thailand is it has one of the strongest economies in Southeast Asia, a uh, very strong middle class, GDP per capita, per capita is pretty strong. But the startup scene is very weak in comparison to other countries in Southeast Asia. Officially, uh, Boston Consulting came out this year with a report that states only 185 startups in the whole country. Uh, Of course, those numbers are probably skewed towards funded startups, very official startups. And there's a lot of, you know, gray zone there. But I wanted to get your take. You know, you've been here long enough and you're very embedded in the startup ecosystem. Why are we so behind with startups in Thailand? I think uh, the the BCG report, I think uh, is basically like using the official report, right? I think, you know, normally when people talk about startup is talk about venture back startup. The uh, the most, because, you know, the, 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 the 10 startup is very, you know, 
paid in a very generous sense. Like people who study in the uh, law firm would also call themselves startup. <laughs> so it's a very, uh, you know, some of the marketing agency, they just started, they, they call it themselves startup as well, right? So mm-hmm. this is a very, you know, the terms are very generic to identify. But I think those reports, most of the reports that, you know, basically mentioned about startup is like a hyper growth venture back startup. Right. So those yeah. startups that are very, very, yes, very limited right here. Uh, but then also there's a, the, the most of the people I, when I interact with the community and talk with the people, most of the people are like, you know, uh, it's a lifestyle businesses. They started the startup and became a lifestyle or maybe uh, they just like, you know, some of them, they have to register in Singapore because of they can get the funding. Right. Mm-hmm. And the mm-hmm. uh so the funding if they need some kind of funding from outside, you definitely have to register in Singapore. You cannot be, you know, in the Hyderabad and Thai company, right? And the I see a lot of like, you know, the small uh lifestyle uh, uh startup and the solo pranya, like especially in terms of like uh uh digital nomad, like expect. So left to live yeah. here in uh, uh, Thailand, but it's like, you know, trying to pay some solo prania kind of things, so, you know, sell it to the outside of Thailand, right? So mm-hmm. uh, so most of the people in my community that I would see is normally like, you know, as like lifestyle businesses, solo prania, and the, uh, what is the the other type? Of, it's like most of them are like maybe the early stage or aspiring founders who will come and you know learn about how they want to start a startup. So those kind right. of like you know venture bed hyper growth startup are very very difficult to find. Stay very very difficult to find in uh, Bangkok. I think the whole reason is like uh, the ecosystem itself is not very supporting. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. So you have to be uh, really uh, need to have that. Look at some of the successful uh, case study of, you know, the successful that startup in the BCG report that you will see. Those founders are someone that already had experience in the some kind of, you know, different uh, start, different business before, or they might come from the rich family. Right. And then. Mm-hmm. So there is no, you know, it's very difficult to find someone with a self-made, like, okay, you know, I would just go and pay some big thing next. It's very difficult to uh, find it here. Uh, I think it mm-hmm. has to do with, uh, do with the, basically, ecosystem is not really, you know, uh, helping in that way. Let's look at that. You know, some of the people who here to, uh, in the university, for example, last time I saw, uh, one guy, he's been in some kind of AI, uh, AI uh, like, uh, you know, argumented reality with the AI stuff. They were like uh, one mm-hmm. of the project, the, uh, pro- as a side, uh, the, the, the project during their CS study in Chula, I guess. But, you know, they, they build that things. And then so for them, it's like the only way for them to get money is get the grant from the DBA or NIA. So I told, I asked them, okay, how much you normally get? It's one million baht. Mm-hmm. You, can, you can really, you cannot even pay yourself to pay something big yep. with that one million baht. It's like, how can you get funded? So I said, oh no, we have to go to, we have to come to Singapore, we have to register here, we have to look for some, you know, support for that. So I think, yeah, ecosystem is the main problem here. I think it's not really helpful uh, in a way that you know really given the uh like an environment that they could come and bail and really be successful right and right, i think that's right, the right. main thing from my take i think that's my take okay so what i've what i've found speaking to a few founders here is that setting up a company is not difficult but as you mentioned if you want to raise money for your venture incorporating in thailand is not going to cut it you need to be in hong kong or in singapore and therefore, that's going to skew the numbers, I guess, because the registry, the, like the company is registered in a different country. So therefore, maybe not accounted for by this BCG report. So I think you're right. Like there are a lot of entrepreneurs. There's no doubt in that, like solo founders, um, all sorts of 
entrepreneurs that are, you know, individuals and not necessarily startups, but if you're looking at pure startups, probably fewer because they're registered elsewhere. So that's what you mean, right? Right, right, right. So, so it, it will be very hard. So some of the be some of the people are entrepreneur head hard, right? So they know how to pay them, but they don't know how to scale it because they don't have, uh, you know, uh, real, uh, how to say, if someone, like say, maybe even in Thai, but if you are someone could able to, you know, you live in Bangkok, you grew up in the, you know, some kind of uh, uh, private school that you mm -hmm. could speak english that you have a, a you have enough comfortable uh, enough you know the level of comfortable uh to, to be comfortable to communicate in english and then when you mm -hmm. celebrate in something you could easily go outside and then raise money right but if you are not no you come from the like you know public school but normally your the thai uh, for them as a english is not really you know very natural for them to communicate so those kind of startup would become afraid to go outside of Thailand to raise money. So they will stay mm -hmm. as a lifestyle small business. And then as it is, then because they, they cannot really, you know, uh, help support from uh, any place to grow because most of the CBC here would not normally fund the uh, early stage startup, right? Unless you have right. uh, some kind of very big, how to say, uh, technology or something that is very, you know, uh, IP, right? Something that they can be trusted on. Okay, you do, you have uh, some special IP or you have uh, some technology so that we can invest you, right? Otherwise, right. it's not. Uh, so okay, I so think that's, a, that's actually of... a really good point that I haven't thought about and I haven't mentioned, like I haven't discussed this with anyone, but all the early stage money in Southeast Asia is anglophone meaning you really have to be proficient in english regardless of where you're operating because that's how you're going to communicate with your investors and as we know thailand is not very anglophone meaning they have their own language they don't need english as much even though they have tourism they've been doing great without being proficient at english like countries like you know uh philippines or whatnot and there is no early stage money in Thailand for Thai specific founders who speak Thai, but would have a big market in Thailand. And that's the bottleneck, essentially. That's actually really interesting. Right. I hadn't right. looked at it that way. And, and as you said, the local money here, there will be some angels, but most of the heavy money will be CVCs. And they're only investing at a later stage. And if ever they're investing, they're also tying you to their own ecosystem so it's a bit tricky to to grow from there very Correct. cool insights yeah so something i hadn't thought so, about thank you for that I really right. appreciate it awesome uh the one other things that uh one interesting uh insight that i received right uh the receive is like you know there used to be a uh a, a accelerator program from GTEC. Right, so uh, they created a lot of uh, co startup from the GTEC accelerator program before COVID. Right, but after COVID, now the data accelerator program was stopped. Now the data even uh, totally march with the true. So there is no more accelerator program. So one of the uh, uh, the person uh, in the our community since when we started as a YC startup school community, uh, that person he was part of that data accelerator program before. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so last time I met him and I sit with him and talk to him and I see, okay, uh, my data is not here anymore. But why does a uh, data could really generate some good startup before, and then no other accelerator program are not really doing good as what data, you know, uh, like data accelerator program, right? He mm -hmm. said that's anything to do with the management. Uh, the the person who ran the accelerator program know that accelerator program is a long game long term game right so you yeah. you you have to uh you have to invest and you have to spend money you have to invest but your return will be not immediate you have to you know see foresee the whole future right and then so some other accelerator program that the, the person who managed could not even to convince that point to the management, to the top level management. So that's why they cannot get some, you know, uh, proper support from the corporate 
to run that accelerator programs as a role. So the DTEC accelerator program seem to generate a lot of good startup. And then I, I asked, you know, what would, what is the reason why DTEC is different from some other accelerator program? Because it seems to be DTEC is really doing well, generating, uh, create, you know, uh, could generate into startup. So he said, like, it's depend on the management uh, who uh, lead that accelerator program really know, uh, you know, this is the, uh, this is the, uh, you know, the mindset that you really have to invest and that you don't really have to look for the long-term gain. And so he, he was mm -hmm. able to, uh, you know, convince that to the management, top level management that, you know, hey, you know, they, to pay the accelerator program, you have to be, uh, you you need to have this and that. And so he, he could convey that. That's why they could able to get budget to run that program successfully. And so that is one yeah. of the insights that I've had. With, um, sorry about that. Are you familiar with the True Digital Park Incubator as well? I Like, it seems like they're doing quite well as well. Um, I've, you know, I've been interacting with them quite a bit. Uh, they have a nice roster of startups, but again, all of their investors are, there are very few local investors, right? So a lot of their investors are foreign and to be part of it, almost you have to be f like Anglophone, which is very limiting because right. not everyone Correct. is in Thailand, right? Right. Right. So I think uh, they have a different, different program as well, right? So I think uh, one of the things is like they got incubation program for the startup outside of Thailand. If they want to come in to uh, see the Thailand market, you have to pay for 100 k and then get that. They will give you uh, kind of like uh, some of the uh, services and plus the program for the one year visa and then go work in speed and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think that there's a sub, right. uh, program from the true, uh, digital effect. Yeah. So there's efforts from Thailand overall to boost their startup ecosystem. It just takes time basically. Yeah, I mean, definitely, right? So, uh, so that's, you know, if uh, management CEO, you know, as a, your accelerator program is good, right? But if we are not really making money in a short time, why bother paying the, you know, as accelerator mm. program, right? Uh, and then uh, I think that one of the problems that everybody point out is also like CBC, but, uh, you know, uh, or the corporate, the, the reason for them, they, their incentive is like, if I'm investing in startup or if I'm creating the accelerator program, it has to be uh, something that we can acquire, right? Something that can integrate that into our business, right? They are not mm -hmm. really want to make money out of, you know, this startup. They, they, they still want to be a startup that will, at one point could be able to be, you know, aligned with what they are doing in their business. So they would, they would want to acquire and integrate it into their uh, business. So uh, there's no one really like thinking long term, Hey, you know, uh, this is the ecosystem you have to pay. You have to invest it in uh, as a long term gain. And so like, you know, if there is no, uh, not that guy, if the people that the, the, the management that's, doesn't have that kind of attitude, it's very hard to pay the ecosystem. But again, you cannot really blame them because, you know, there's a lot of investment, right? So if there is no return on investment for them, I say like, why would I bother investing in it? Unless the government, you know, uh, provide a lot of uh, support and, you know, uh, government should be the one who should really spend money and build in that kind of ecosystem. So, but obviously, government yeah. have also have their many, you know, <laughs> agenda that they have to focus on, prioritize on. So, you know, startup is not really something that's maybe properly not on the top of the list. So, and it's not extremely ingrained in the Thai culture, right? Like in in North America, for example, so many young people want to. Well, now they want to be influencers, but let's say. It, a few years ago, everyone wanted to be a startup founder, right? It was the cool thing. Yeah. Most yeah. most people, the reason was because they thought it, they'd become multimillionaires very fast. But there's a lot of entrepreneurial culture in North America, a little bit less in Europe. But 
I noticed that in Southeast Asia, there are some countries that have it more and others less. What, what are your thoughts on entrepreneurial culture in, in Thailand? I think, uh, like, you know, I mean, there's like every, I mean, let's say everywhere you have a Chinese be descendant people, there's, there's always an entrepreneur <laughs> mindset is there, right? All the Chinese people, uh, uh migrated from, uh, let's 60, 70 years ago, right? Maybe more than that migrated from mainland China to most of the Southeast Asia, because they are all uh, entrepreneurs. They are all the business people. Look at the mm -hmm. uh, history. The reason why they have to leave the mainland China was the, uh, the Chinese, the, the Mo Zedong kind of like, you know, the Chinese culture revolution. Right. So they are confiscating everything and, you know, try to, uh, uh, it is a communist thing. Right. So all the rich people have to leave and bring all their, uh, property, uh, you know, well, and uh, they have to bring all their well as much as they can and leave the mainland. So all these people are just across everywhere, right? Indonesia, I mean, uh, Philippines for sure, in Myanmar, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia. So these are the people spread all, all over this Southeast Asia. So those people, uh, those family come from those family, they all have that entrepreneur mindset, right? So they are all about making businesses, create, you know, building some uh, 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 well and uh, big corporations. But the thing is that these are like all these people come from the like the family kind of entrepreneur. Uh, things like mm -hmm. they they don't they don't need that venture venture uh, sub, uh venture capital support right so they have all all right. the family business so if we are talking about entrepreneur yes there's a lot of people with the entrepreneur mindset but the thing is like not venture back kind of stuff you know entrepreneur uh those, mm -hmm. those cultures are not really you know how to say and not we we couldn't find enough of those people those type of people right it's a it's a different type of entrepreneurship they're still very much business yeah. oriented but less right venture back <clears throat> um okay so i'm curious about your thoughts because you've been exposed to this country for a long time are you seeing some startup uh, or, or types of startups that are working really well in the rest of the world but haven't yet come to thailand like any projects that you you think would be beneficial for the country Mm, that's a very hard to uh hard to take because for me like I've been in the B two B space for too long so you know uh that would be the only thing that I would normally uh, keep an eye on so yeah mm -hmm. I mean for, for sure in terms of uh B two B uh even in the B two B space there's uh, a lot of things can be have uh things can be improved and there's a lot of room to grow uh let's say uh for example even uh, look at all these insurance big, big company insurances and all like the one that you need with the call center right oh, yeah. then all those big cons call centers are still using pabas technology right so the pabas uh, headware and uh, managing all the call center right but that can be, you know, easily replaced with a lot of the new technology that existed for more than a decade now, right? But again, these are all legacy software, legacy tools that, you know, a lot of the corporates stay using it because, you know, uh, again, all the corporate enterprises are very hard to move, right? So it's also take time. So one of the startup scaling is now, I mean, is trying to get into most of those uh, uh, big corporate moving away from the PABAs, you know, headware to the cloud, you know, uh, tools that manage all the call centers. So, I mean, there's a lot of room here, uh, especially in the uh, in the B2B space, enterprise world. Uh, a lot of people are, you know, things are like maybe <laughs> they get like, you know, less than 10 or 15 years ago, the technology that was, more than 10 or 15 years ago they're still using it especially for me mm -hmm. like maybe in the hotel industry as well uh, uh like you know a, a lot of legacy software stay in place and every new hotel open they still have to continue using the legacy software and there's a lot of innovation and a lot of new techno uh new you know startup 
can, how to say, you can create a lot of new startup uh, that can really help them transform in a, a new way, right? So, yeah. So my question is more like, I know that, you know, Thailand has a decent population, decent, decent market, but it has its own language, which is completely unique to, to Thailand. It's all its own writing and all that. Like the solutions that you're talking about, the legacy solution for them to be replaced, is it basically taking something that's working really well in North America and simply translating it and bringing it to the market? Is, can it be as simple as that to kind of dominate a, a, a market with a certain app? Or is there more to it? And that's why a lot of people are, or, or no one's doing that type of approach. I think there's a, uh, uh, there's a, uh, two, maybe uh, more than one reason, right? The one of the reason is the budget. Uh, let's say the big corporate, the, the tools that they are using, the, like, let's say the digital transformation. Last time when I was, when I came to Bangkok in uh, 16 years, or let's say 15 years ago, that was the period people are still talking about digital transformation, right? A lot of the enterprise, uh, they are moving away from the manual process into digital transformation, right? So those are like 10, 15 years ago, that was the, they, they, they make a big investment, right? So mm -hmm. now after 10 to 15 years, it's still like for big corporate to move to, you know, the new things, it's like stay very, uh, you know, hey, we just spent big billion of, you know, uh, money on less than years ago, 15 years ago. Now, you know, we still can use it. Why don't we continue using all that, right? That's a one mm -hmm. aspect. Uh, the other thing is like uh, the big corporations, uh, like, you know, they, said they are, they are, uh, they are consist of like so many people, manpower, right? The training mm -hmm. for them is to, you know, it, it costs a lot. You can buy software and replace it, but to train all this uh, employee to adapt to the new technology, new tool, I think that's, that is the hardest part. Okay. You have to I, spend I see what you're saying. So that. not like, is the number of people needing to be trained the issue or are Thai companies still quite conservative and therefore if they're, you know, they've invested in a, in something 15 years ago, they're going to run it as long as they can, even though it can be completely obsolete. And as a follow-up question, is it hard for Thai companies, especially the big corporation, to, you know, be convinced of a higher ROI if they invest in new tools? Because I, you know, and, and and again, I always refer to North America because that's where I'm I've operated most of my of career. Course, yeah. Yeah. It was obvious that when you do B2B sales, if you can prove a certain ROI to the company that is basically positive, they invest this much, they make this much more money on, on efficiency or whatever it is, usually it's a no-brainer and they can just approve it and sign it and, and implement it. When I started doing B2B sales in the Philippines, I realized that doesn't matter as much as building a relationship with the company. And if they like you, then they'll start looking into the ROI and the value to their company. And then they'll measure it against how much effort it would be to implement. And if the whole bouquet of information sort of works, then you'll be able to sign a deal, which is extremely frustrating as a salesperson. So you've been oh, working yeah. in B2B, you've been working in Southeast Asia, but notably in Thailand. Is it the same? How different is it? Tell me more about it. It's the same. Uh, so like, you know, you, 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 it doesn't matter what your product is, like, you know, how, how, uh, how could, you know, whatever our wine that you could, uh, you know, you could show them like, you know, Hey, you will be making this mess and this, but again, they come to the, the people, uh, like a relationship, like, you know, how can I trust you? Uh, and the, the other thing is also as well, like, you know, Hey, I'm a, you know, especially like when you're selling to enterprise businesses, you say like, hey, I'm just an employee, right? But now mm. the system I have doesn't break anything, right? I'm say okay, right? I don't need to worry about it. But if it is, if mm -hmm. don't break and don't fix it, right? That's one of the That's attitude, awesome. right? So if I go and fix it, I just volunteer on it. Like, you know, I, I just make, hey, you know, we should really move to this thing. We can uh, make the work. And then the person who champion that new project, 
have to take all the responsibility now, right? So, but if we don't know that can be, if, if you don't know you personally or trusted you, you could say, why why would I even go the champion in on that, right? I think that's the, mm-hmm. that's a kind of like, you know, I think that you have to, uh, you also need to be in relationship with the person who will champion you. And then so if that you have a proven, so that's why, you know, some of the things uh, like here, it's like, it's take time to go in. But once you really go in, it's take too much time to get out as well. So it's a good and bad. Yeah. You go in very, very hard. But once you are in, uh, you, you, you don't necessarily you you don't be kicked out so easily you know that's 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 the yeah that's, yeah so it's long term it relationships basically once you've signed yeah. and um what's their what's the company's take on AI in in the in Thailand are they pretty open about it are they completely ignoring it what are your thoughts on that I think like say I mean the AI in a way since the open chat chat ch- ch- GPT uh, make it a worldwide you know uh, the news like that was 2021 and up 2021 right uh, 2022 mm-hmm. right so over a year yep. but some of the uh, you know the uh, uh, how to say some of the people in like a big corporate like innovation center some people are started talking about it trying to uh, look into that. But it's not like, you know, uh, how to say, it's not like really like, hey, let's look and see what are the, uh, I think I would say like people like look and uh, you just wait and see situation, I think. It's not like, hey, you know, really, let's move it now, let's move it to AI as much as we can. But I, I think they haven't reached to that stage yet. Most of the, okay, uh, so even it. most of the, yeah. It's still very much like it was, um, you know, Southeast Asia, what happens is that they tend to follow what happens in North America with a big lag. It used to be 15 years. I think now it's a lot faster. But this podcast is called Next Big Wave, right? And I see Southeast Asia as the next big wave in innovation and startups. In order to be the next big wave, they're going to start, they're going to have to start either you know being on trend or innovate faster than north america and europe i'm just wondering how do we get asia to that level because they are conservative economies usually uh very traditional like how do we switch that around i think the younger generation is all extremely tech savvy more more advanced than most youth in north america and europe it's clear to me when I visit cities in South, uh, Southeast Asia that they are more developed than North America and Europe. I mean, the transit system, the healthcare system, it's more advanced, it's more developed. So now how do we apply that to the startup scene? It's just, it, it's bound to happen. I'm just curious, what is the trigger to that event? Wow. Uh, I mean, uh, definitely like that for more people to come into the uh, startup ecosystem, like, hey, you know, the, 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 the success story, right? Uh, the success story of like, you know, some young founders like coming into that and then found the, you know, uh, like a successfully exit that. So if there is some, those kind of, you know, more story that can be, uh, uh, you know, uh, for the new and younger generation to get inspiration from, I think more and more people will definitely come to like, hey, you know, there's, there's a way to create the world. And then it doesn't need to be my family has to be a rich family for me to be able to successful, right? So that kind of mm-hmm. message that young people would see, oh, if I really have that kind of ego system if i just really go and you know uh spend my life uh, being in the real what people the things that what i can really uh, what pe- the people real want and then i could able to make that big money and then definitely you know uh there will be a, a, a good inspiration for them yeah so how how do you stay up to up to speed on you know tech news in southeast asia do you have uh, a resource that you go to on a daily basis. I'm just curious. I want to get up to speed on on what's going on in Southeast Asia. So what what's what do you recommend? Uh, I for me, I I normally like see. Uh, I just subscribe some of the uh, like tech crash and those stuff from uh, 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 you know uh, 
the what is that what do you call it the not not in uh, not america all right so those are the news that normally i will chase and i will follow but in terms of southeast asia i think there's a some tech in asia and then the mm-hmm. e27 i think uh those are the news that i i would normally uh subscribe and uh get information from and um, but the in Thailand, like you know, there's only one big media tech in Asia in terms of startup. Mm-hmm. But I think tech in Asia, the problem with tech in Asia is most of the news are mostly they uh, they publish both mostly in Thai. So I couldn't able mm-hmm. to you know really get benefit from that. Uh, they post sometimes in English, but it's very uh, very few articles. So so in terms of uh, news about. Thailand is there very difficult to you know get the insights unless you you are out there talking to the people and then you would know. So uh, maybe that's something that somebody might come up as a startup, like you know, hey, it's a there's a news about startup in Thailand in general. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so like I think two years ago, uh, Amanda Kua started working on one more scoop, right? Uh, it's a newsletter about startups in Southeast Asia. I thought it was very interesting. There's definitely news about every country, not specifically Thailand. Uh, it's in English, so it's pretty uh, it's pretty easy to, to access. It just focuses more on the deals that have been made. So people who've raised money, things like that. So like for me, that's one of the top resources I use to stay up to date on Southeast Asian tech. Tech in Asia, my problem is they gatekeep it and you have to pay subscription, right? right? It's frustrating. Yeah. So I, I don't pay for that right. yet. I think I'm I'm about to to pay for it because I think most of the news yeah. is there and it's pretty handy. Right. Yeah. Cool. I think, um, yeah, that... So. No, go ahead. Sorry. No, no. I think, uh, you know, this is some kind of news. Like that is just a one thing. But uh, uh, it's a part of the ecosystem building, right? So as long as you make a lot of media, a lot of, you know, news and everything happening in the ecosystem that really, you know, make more awareness to the young people and then more people will come in, participate in the startup ecosystem. And then the the more volume you have, the more chance of, you know, uh, you could generate more successful startup, I think. So that's, that's a kind of thing as the ecosystem is totally stay missing uh or not really reach to the point that could really uh create a lot of you know uh uh that momentum right so the only thing here we have is the tech source and which is not really that doing great so they only do mm-hmm. be able to do summit once a year right so this is like you know during the time like one august when uh Dexel has this summit like everybody talk about uh startup everybody excited about it like said, mm-hmm. at the time, September, October, everybody forgot about what startup is. So, you know, uh, that, 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 that really need those kind of, you know, like that's, that's totally different from Singapore, right? Singapore is always, you know, so many activities happening, you know, so many things happening, right? So that there's a lot of like uh, news and then in terms of startup, you say like, oh, there's a vibrant ecosystem here, you know, a lot of things happening. So people would uh, have a chance to... Uh, you know, participate in that uh, the whole ecosystem. I agree. I think um, communities like yours are actually key to educating people and keeping them in the loop, right? Uh, and that's why we're going to work together to keep building that community for Southeast Asia. And yeah, just one you. thing before we, we, we uh, close this podcast, I was speaking to Charles Lee a few podcasts ago about how uh, blockchain and Web3 were kind of big in Vietnam. And you were here through the last cycle. Uh, was it something big in, in Thailand? Other than all the you know, solopreneurs that are crypto traders, I'm curious about the real Thai people. Were they interested in that? Are there developers in the blockchain? Is that something in Thailand? Not really. Uh, I don't think not really. Uh, that that the mostly is about the the crypto things, right? So they might there's a, some. Uh, they there there was some uh, web web three uh, 
uh, meet up and things happen. But unfortunately, I was not really interested in those areas. So not really mm. want to admit a lot of people. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, after AI came and then those all the things uh, slowly, you know, I, I don't see any other media for things happening these days seriously now. So, yeah, I don't think okay. it's quite big enough here. All right. And uh, so one last thing, is there something you want to shout out to or something you want to plug for yourself before we we end this podcast? <laughs> Yeah, awesome. Uh, so yeah, we have that the our we call our startup community. So o u r startup community dot com. That will now uh, link to the linking group. Uh, hopefully soon I will be able to pay some kind of website. Uh, this community have like we have a vibrant community of startup. Uh, meanings like you know we have a sixty percent expert community and forty percent local, so we have a very vibrant uh combination of you know local and expert. I think that's make us unique and vibrant because if you go to some of the uh community that will be very expert expert or some community would be very local local, but we have a very good mix. So you know there's a lot of uh activities and networking opportunities and interactions and you know uh things happening so if you are really interested in startup uh want to you know get involved with the community connect be able to connect to other people join the group uh, our startup community.com yeah i can vouch for that because i'm in the group and it's definitely very active and correct me if I'm wrong, Ted, but right now it's exclusive for Thailand, right? You might expand it in the future, but limited to Thailand right now. Yeah, at this moment, yeah, my goal is to, because the reason I started is like as a founder, I want to get away from my bootstrap lifestyle business into the something venture bank, uh, help a group company, right? To start up, I want to pay new things, right? So that's why I came to, uh, I, I look at in the ecosystem, I didn't find one. Maybe it might be because there's net exit existence or also because it's just right after the COVID, right? It was 2022. So I happened to create that one. And then, of course, there's a product market fit, right? The people really need it. That's why these are people, uh, you know, once you can, you see, oh, this, you, I could really get benefit. I see I, imp I started inviting my friends. So, you know, this really became like, we don't really have any social media presence or doing any promotion, right? So even though podcasts, I'm talking about our community, this is the first podcast I'm talking about our community. So we never really, it, it's a word of mouth. And then people bring their friends, they came, they enjoy it, they see the opportunity to connect with other people. So they invited other friends. That's why this community became bigger. So without any, you know, proper organization or supporting, uh, so you, we don't have any proper support from anything unless with only few uh the urban office the co-working space is only been our main sponsor that's sponsoring as for the venue right other than that we don't really got any support from government or local community or uh, you know some other uh big startup organization or corporate but it just the community uh is really see there is a value in it that's why we just keep growing so amazing well that's the pod thank you ted for being on today real pleasure to have you and i'm Thanks. sure we'll have a follow-up episode at some point sure awesome yeah so